All right, first one. First one looked good. Divide both sides by 6. We get x cubed equal to negative 216. The only way to, um, just to show the work, cubed root undoes something cubed, FYI. So these operations undo each other. x equals negative 6. I saw that a lot going around. Uh, this one, eighth root of that big number. If you actually took 4 times itself, 8 times... Four times four, okay, I could write it down forever, but it's actually four to the eighth. Those undo each other, so it's just left with four. Somebody asked, hey, how can I show work for that? That's how you can show work. Or you could write out all the fours times each other and then circle the group. That's how you could show work for that. It would not be positive or negative because I already gave you the root. I already gave you the radical. If I'm solving, like in this first one, if it was x to the eighth and you were solving and you had to put in the radical, that's when the plus or minus could come in, if I had an even exponent. But because I already give you this, I'm already indicating that it's a positive. If I wanted the negative answer, there would have been minus or a negative sign out there. All right, ladies and gents, we're going to start 7.2. It's going to be extremely similar to 7.1. We're going to be simplifying and everything, but we're really going to pay attention to that. Um... Past properties that we kind of forgot about. I'm going to pay attention to past properties that we forgot about. So the goal here is all about properties. We're going to recap what we did. Now the bad thing is, is that your guided notes have these tables on them. These tables are pretty small. So use your judgment. If you're a big writer, you might want to put this down on your own piece of paper. Or just goal. Try to write small. I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. That was my bad. It wasn't until I saw the printed stuff at... 1121 <laughs> that I realized, whoops, that's pretty short on your guided notes. All right, product of properties. My bad. Product of powers property. If you have the following where you have a to the m times a to the n, let's recap that that's a to the m plus n. So, for example, if we had 3 squared times 3 to the 7th, we're going to keep the base being 3. Notice how we say a, a, a. So we're going to keep 3 as the base, and we're just going to add the exponents, giving us 3 to the ninth. We're going to try to do these without a calculator is the goal. All right, power of a power property. It looks like this. If you have something to a power raised to another power, we're going to multiply those powers. So an example, let's say we have 5 the two, or sorry, five squares raised to the fourth power. We're going to multiply those powers. We're just going to end with five to the eighth. So what if we have power of a product? So if you have something in parentheses raised to any power, you're going to take those things to that power. Example, if we had two times three to the sixth, again, we're going to act like I should probably use variables. x times y to the 6th. That means you can take 2 to the 6th times 3 to the 6th. So, quotient of powers property. If we have a fraction, then we can take the numerator exponent minus the denominator exponent. We never went over this in chapter 6 because we realized, hey, wait a second, if I wrote a times, if I wrote a times a times a times a in the numerator and a times a times a in the denominator, we can keep figuring out, okay, how many ones are created? a divided by a is a 1. Well, this is the shortcut. You could really just take that numerator exponent minus the denominator, and I think a lot of you figured that out. So what if we have this? Notice how the base is still going to stay 3, and we're just going to take 7 minus 5, getting a 3 squared. So if we have a fraction and there's a power on the outside, that means the numerator gets that power and the denominator gets that power. So if we have a fraction raised to a power, that means the numerator and the denominator gets that power. So if we have a 0 power, no matter what it is, if something is raised to a zero power, 
That means if an entire parentheses with a whole bunch of junk in it is raised to a zero power, it's just one. Nine times out of ten, you'll see that on an ACT or SAT to really trip you up. There's going to be this complicated thing within parentheses, and the whole thing is going to be raised to the zero power. It's just trying to trip you up. Anything raised to the zero power is one. Oh, and then, well, it looks like that accidentally came up, too, at the same time. Anytime you have a negative power, it's the reciprocal. So a to the negative n is 1 over a to the n. If the negative power is in the denominator, then that means you need to move it to the numerator. So you always try to look for what would take the less characters. I guess on a test, I would have to accept both of these. Ooh. Oh. Okay. Well, let's continue. Number two. So we're left with four to the fourth. So you could either put four fourths or... 256. So here's the thing, right? We could easily put this in our calculator, put all the parentheses necessary, uh, but if you show no work, you don't get credit. We understand? Clear. Great. Next, you don't have any of these? So if we subtract those powers, numerator minus the denominator power, so y to the two-thirds minus one-third, y to the one-third. Let's talk about, okay, rewriting. Sometimes in your head you've got to figure out, well, we just went through all this rewriting of, what if I make that cubed root of y squared divided by cubed root of y? So after we simplify, we can still see we get the cubed root of y. All right. So 64 to the 1 -third. Now if I put it over 1, it'll just be 64 to the 1 -third. So uh, let's simplify that. So cubed root of 64 of their product, cubed root of 64, we get 4. Fourth root of their quotient, we've got to figure out the fourth root of the 16, looking at 2. And then check up here. We can. We can take that 32. What we've got to realize is, there, are there any perfect cubed roots in a 32? And there are. It's 8. 8 goes into 32. Cubed root of 8 is in 32. So I can decompose 32 into 8 times 4. And then, like, like I was saying before, how that equal sign goes back and forth. I can rewrite this to be the cubed root of 8 times the cubed root of 4 and make that a 2. That becomes a 2. So it's 2 times the cubed root of 4. So when I talk simplify also, we need to recognize if there's any perfect cubes, or let's say we had a square out there, or what if we had a fourth root? Are there any perfect fourth roots that are in there. You've got to make sure it doesn't decompose into perfect roots, whatever the nth root is. You've got to take them individually. So fourth root of 256. I think it's four. We talked about this earlier. Four. So fourth root of x to the eighth so with that little thought of what would this look like exponentially, this becomes x squared. Final answer would be 4x squared times the fourth root of y. So after taking the square root of each and figuring out how many perfect square roots do I have? It actually turns in to something a lot nicer than what we started with. Now, on an SAT, I can see them doing this. 
where they would have it rewritten as 2x over 3z times the square root of y. And you need to recognize that both of those mean the same thing. Sometimes they put the radical off to the side to where 2x over 3z is in the coefficient position. Got to talk about like terms. I'm going to talk about 12 first. So I have a lot of feeling that you guys already wrote down 12. Like terms. Uh, we need to recognize these are, are like terms because of the index and of the radicand. Both terms have like radicands, a fifth root of three. Here's why they need to be alike. We just talked about factoring in chapter, well, chapter nine. We talked about it in chapter six. Um, chapter six. And then they have a greatest common factor. They have a greatest common factor of fifth root of three. If I took out the greatest common factor, fifth root of three, what would be left? We'd have two minus one. So how many do, so two minus one we can do in our heads, that's one, times fifth root of three, this leaves us with fifth root of three. Now, I'm going to do that one time of that undistribution, because notice from the beginning we had two of these minus one of these gives us one of these. So let's go here. We can see the two to the one-eighth. I could rewrite it as seven, Eighth root of two, put it in radical form. Or I could factor it out. Two to the one-eighth times the quantity of seven plus four. Taking out that greatest common factor. Or I could look at it as seven of these plus four of these is eleven of these. <coughs> FYI, this is kind of like incorrect grammar. You would probably write it in radical form, or if you were doing this problem on the ACT, whatever, they would write it as 11 times the eighth root of 2. For some reason, that's more mathematically acceptable writing. So in the last one, 6 times the square root of x. Now, FYI, your homework is a lot harder than this. Oh, whoa, 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 let me explain, let me explain. Only because... Uh, your last problems on your homework, so the last two, look like these, except inside that radical, there's some perfect squares. Or if the index is three, then there's some perfect cubes that you have to recognize. Hey, how can I simplify each term before I add them together? So, your homework is more difficult than what you see up here, but... It's doable. You just have to take each term, find the perfect squares or find the perfect cubes, whatever that index is, and then move forward.